to long weekend traffic. Gibby Road northbound. Little out of town for the start of the long weekend. Highway is starting too slow with the holiday traffic. We're seeing delays of up to out there coming into the Easter long weekend. And for those travelling in Colacabani. Easter in Australia. What does it mean to you? A holiday with chocolate? A time for reflection? What the most sacred period on the Christian calendar? For me, it's a mix. The story of our antipathy and Easter goes way back to the days of colonisation. We don't know very much about the first Easter, but we do know that it took place on the 23rd of March, 1788. We do know that there was no church. From the past... In the paper this morning, we could read that this year, Easter eggs have been virtually sold out. ...to the present. Why the bilby, not an egg, oh, or the Easter bunny? Oh, because it's a bilby. Because, because it's a bilby. It and we should be doing bilbies that are Australian. The hats... ..and the holidays. <laughs> Solemnity... ..and salvation. We go on a journey to the heart of Christianity's holiest week to find out what Easter is all about. Yeah. Oh, there, Easter dinner. Easter dinner. Oh. This is in uh, Kiel. Namichi's house. house. For as long as I can remember, growing up first in Malaysia, then Australia, my mum and dad have always made oh, a big a deal of Easter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Biryani and shepherd's pie, how is that? Yeah. <laughs> Easter party on the street. Uh, remember right. that, that, that close? Yeah, everyone used to bring the barbecues yeah, out. Yeah, brought the barbecues yeah. out and we party into the oh. late into the night. I like your pants, Jeremy. It's hideous. <laughs> it was very fashionable at the time. Yeah. Do you remember this neighbour's name? Sylvia. Sylvia, Sylvia yeah, yeah. It's always been a time for friends and family, culminating in a big Where feast. Is is it Palm Sunday? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. The donkey. Yeah. Underpinning it all, our Catholic faith. Yeah. And the donkey used to poop everywhere. Yeah. 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 Remember that? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's, that's, right. that's my yeah. most outstanding memory from Palm Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. It was the oh, pooping donkey. Dear. <laughs> I think the reality is that for most people today, when we say Easter, they think four days off, maybe a camping trip to the coast or in the mountains. There's a large sense in which this Easter story has been lost to modern contemporary culture. But it's also true that there is something compelling and mysterious and captivating about the Easter story that I think draws many of us back to that remembrance of that historical and critical cosmic event. Easter is simply the church's way of remembering the central narrative of the faith, which is the life, uh, teachings, death and resurrection of Jesus. Easter doesn't mark the exact date of Christ's resurrection. Its timing is driven by the ancient rhythms of seasonal change. It's important to realise that all of the festivals of Christianity and indeed of most of the religions that are present in Australia were actually developed in the Northern Hemisphere. The climate was a great deal more dramatically differentiated between winter and summer. And so summer was a time of life, rejoicing, community, ritual, plenty, whereas winter was a time of deprivation and isolation. The spring equinox marks the point where the really savage part of winter in the Northern Hemisphere is passing. People recognised that the sun was going to return and so Jesus' resurrection fitted that pattern for a ritual perfectly because it was a triumph of life, the sun, over death, the winter and the dark. And so being in the Southern Hemisphere, our Easter falls on the autumn equinox, not the spring equinox. And autumn falling from warmth 
into chill, from light into dark, doesn't actually accord very well with the idea of resurrection. Many of us associate Easter with just one week, culminating in Easter Sunday, marking Christ's resurrection. But whether you attend church or just like to enjoy a chocolate treat or two, the traditional Easter rituals start much earlier, 47 days earlier, in fact. Who doesn't want a pancake? Pancakes, boys, they're running. They're smelling the pancakes or they're late for choir. One of, them one of Shrove Tuesday's best known customs is making and eating pancakes. Teachers at Newington College use this as a conversation starter about Easter. Do you know anything besides pancakes? Not really. Not really? What's yeah. Lent? No way, they don't eat anything. They yeah, just... good. It's the 40 days before Easter. Where they just don't eat fish. Yeah. Do you have any idea what today is? Celebrate Catholic. Waverly. Celebrate Catholic. Christianity in general. Yeah, it's a lead up to Lent. So tell me about Shrove Tuesday. What is it? How do you explain it to a layperson? Uh, Shrove Tuesday, I think, is um, sort of the last hurrah before, uh, so a party before a season when you're meant to be deliberately more solemn, um, you know, less, less sort of concerned about um, enjoying yourself all the time. I guess there's always a sense that if you're going to do something like that, it's better to have a, you know, a big party before you begin it. Uh, so, so pancakes is, um, it was always a thing of um, getting all the, the flour and everything out of the pantry, which was... The perishables. Yes, absolutely, yeah, to use those up because you were going to go through a period when you would deliberately abstain from things. See, this is the interesting thing because as a child growing up, I remember Shrove Tuesday being solemn just because of what was coming right. ahead. Okay. Why yeah. would that be? Uh, of course, most religious people aren't much fun. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, I think that's probably a, a bit of a distortion. That, that really, it, Shrove Tuesday is meant to be the, um, the, 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 the sort of the, the, the fun moment before we become not fun. What's your perception of what this is all about? It marks the day before Lent and those 40 days where you're giving up something. My grandparents are... Uh, religious, so they also often talk to us about Easter and the meaning of Easter and why it's important for us to celebrate. So what's coming up? What's a big Ash Easter? Easter? Ash Wednesday is tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. That's, that went well. <laughs> The preparations for Ash Wednesday follow a familiar age-old routine at Christ Church St Lawrence, an Anglican church in the heart of Sydney. The solemnity of the Easter period is symbolised by toning down the interior of the church. Purple is the colour of solemnity, so we wear purple uh, for funerals. It's a colour of mourning usually have magnificent flowers and things in the church, uh, but they've all been taken away. And I guess it's all about denying ourselves something that we really like, so that when it all comes back at Easter, uh, there's, there's a bigger celebration. Where do the ashes come from and what's the significance of them? So the people are invited in the weeks leading up to Ash Wednesday to bring back their palm crosses, uh, which they from the previous from year. the previous year. Yeah. So, so when on on Palm Sunday we we give everyone in the congregation a, a lovely green palm cross, uh, and as the weeks go on, it sort of becomes very dry and brown, uh, and then in the weeks leading up to Ash Wednesday, people are encouraged to bring them back, and that's turned into ash. Ash Wednesday is the official start of Lent. 40 days of fasting and reflection. Bless these ashes and grant that they may be for us as a sign of the spirit of penitence with which we shall keep this season of preparation for Easter. I invite you to come forward now and receive on your head in ash the sign of the cross, the symbol of our salvation. Ash Wednesday began in, in about the 8th century and people used to actually cover themselves with ash and wear sackcloth uh, and go into a convent or a monastery for the whole 40 days of Lent. Uh, so it was really very, very grim. Uh, but now we, we just have the sign of the cross in ash to, to remind us that, that we are entering a solemn penitential time. The number 40 in the Bible 
is usually associated with a period of testing and affliction. So you're up, we might remember the flood, the judgment of the flood was a 40 day period. You also have in, in the book of Judges, uh, Israel is captured by the Philistines for 40 years. So the 40 days of Lent also echo Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And so it makes sense for church tra tradition to pick up that number and impose it into this lead up to Easter. But we do not wear ash on our faces to look dismal or even pious. The ashes now on our face are badges of courage and hope. You said during your service something really interesting, that your reservedness during Lent, that it's just something to remind you of your, your own mortality, but it's not necessarily something to be sad or dour about completely during the Lenten period. No, because Easter is the time of joy and resurrection, um, but you obviously can't have resurrection unless you have death as well. So there's a sort of sense of letting go, uh, facing up to our mortality, the, the inevitability that one day we will die. On Ash Wednesday, and throughout the season of Lent, we choose to go without some of the things that this world has to offer. The, the more traditional thing is that during Lent we're meant to give something up. The most important thing for which but we often people talk more about taking something up. So you might um, become involved in, in some other activity like visiting at a nursing home or going to a homeless shelter or something. So Lent isn't necessarily about saying, well, I'm going to give up alcohol or chocolate. Um, but to say I'm going to do something very purposefully that, that is going to sort of deepen my prayer life and my spirituality. Going to church is especially important for my parents during Lent and it brings back many childhood memories. How did we come to go to church? every day. When did that start? Because we certainly it, didn't do it in Malaysia. When we moved here, it was quite close to Easter. It was during Lent. And I wanted to do something different. And um, like not eating meat or not eating chocolates for Lent wasn't, wasn't me then. And then I said, okay, I'll go to church every day. <laughs> I'll go to church every day, take the children with me. You <laughs> didn't come. I, I wouldn't come because, you know, I, I learned that God is everywhere, you know, <laughs> so not necessarily in a particular building in Diana. Yeah. You, you know, know for me, church. it was like a sacrifice going to church every day. It was something that I'm giving up, you know, if Your not, time. I would have kind of gone to Mirabuko Square and did some shopping and window shopping and had coffee with friends. For me, it was a sacrifice. So I did that for Lent and it became a habit. <laughs> if the driver initially was Lent, once Lent was over, what was the driver? Well, you start something for Lent, you don't give it up after that. Just like you have a New Year's resolution and you keep going with that, don't you? Most people don't actually. <laughs> you, you, you've, got to, you've got to save something for the next Lent. You know, yeah. say, this is what I'm going to do for Lent, but if that's what you're already doing, uh, I can see this not ending too <laughs> well. That's why New Year's resolutions get broken. Yeah, you, 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 you need to break the resolution else, at some point. Like this land, I'm doing something different. Yeah. In January of 1788, Christianity was brought to Australia by the Reverend Richard Johnson. Two months later, he celebrated the first Easter on these shores. Right, so what you're about to see uh, were two books that came on the First Fleet. They came with the Reverend Richard Johnson. He brought them with him. What's interesting is that he brought loads of books, thousands of them. Most of those books have not survived, but these are two that have survived, and they are his personal Bible and his personal prayer book. How much do you know about how Easter was observed in the early days of the colony, in the early years? So we don't know about the first Easter service, but because we have a prayer book which sets out certain prayers and certain readings that are said on certain days, we actually know what it is that he would have read and said on that day. It's the book that is used by Anglicans when they want to run any particular kind of service. One of the things it has is what's called a lectionary, and it sets the readings that you're meant to read on each of the Sundays, so we know what they read on Easter. Uh, you'll notice 
the S there is an F, which is the way they used to write S's in those days. So it's the first day of the week. Cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said unto them, They have taken the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Those words were read on the day that Richard Johnson celebrated the first Easter day, a month after the disembarkation. Not far from the church where Richard Johnson's Bible is kept, Pastor Ray Minicon has a different take on the history of Easter in Australia. The message around Easter is very much one of sacrifice, which I know Aboriginal people relate to in a very particular way. A sacrifice is nothing new to us yet. I, th I think the, the other part of the, the story too is not just about sacrifice, it's about pain, it's about death, it's about trauma. And uh, we understand that part of the story. You have a very special tree on the site of this parish. Tell me about it. It's like a sentinel that's been watching the changes and the seasons of this city uh, for so many hundreds of years. It's one of the oldest trees in Sydney. It's a scarred tree, yeah. Down this way. But this is the only one that's left standing today in the uh, city of Sydney, here, in the CBD of Sydney. Yeah, old well, people would have uh, cut into the tree here to either, if it was for a woman, it would have been a kulamon. If it was for a male, it would have been for a shield, yeah. looking at the shape of it. So then this is a connection for it's... the people who were here before Christianity arrived. It certainly is a, a story that goes beyond Christianity, yes, yes. <laughs> beyond the First Fleet. And Richard Johnson, when he came here, he was gifted 400 acres, and this is part of these 400 acres. This tree stands on the gifted lands to the church to Richard Johnson. So he might have been a witness to this tree, but I can guarantee you this, this tree was a witness to him and the ways in which he then conducted himself on Gadigal country here. Does it connect Christianity and Aboriginality, do you think, this tree? Well, for us, it's connecting the story of Jesus and the pain that he went through. Jesus, you know, when he died on the cross, there was all these scars that he went through, the nails in his hands and his feet and by his side, the crown of thorns. Those scars are very, very real to uh, Christianity, they're real to us, they're real and this, this particular tree here represents a lot. The significance of the Easter message has often not resonated with wider Australia. What's the main thing you, you remember about Easter each year? Oh, well, the holiday, I suppose, the holiday. Well, uh, Easter has meant, of course, a holiday, uh, a four-day break, which is very acceptable. Uh, it also means, of course, uh, uh, the uh, celebrating of a, um, a religious, uh, a religious um, happening in days gone by. I think it's a oh. celebration that tends to have been forgotten. Oh, the celebration hasn't been forgotten, but it's the way things are celebrated that, you know, it's a bit wrong, I think, but still. Well, why do you think it's wrong? Well, everyone thinks of enjoying themselves, don't they? Nothing religious. To me, I don't know, it just doesn't, doesn't mean that much. Uh, truthfully, I, I, it doesn't really mean that much to me at all. There's no mistaking what time of year it is. The Easter eggs and Easter bunnies have been on display for weeks, if not months, and they seem to keep multiplying as we get closer to the Easter weekend. Connection of the egg with Easter is pretty simple. The egg is a clear sign of life. And this was true in the ancient world. It's true actually in a lot of other religions as well. Um, over in certain Eastern traditions, Hinduism for example, and sometime, some parts of Chinese tradition, there are ideas of a cosmic egg which caused the earth to come into being. So eggs have been associated with new life for a very long time. Competition for shelf space is fierce and in some shops, Easter eggs and bunnies have had to make way for some very Australian contenders. 
We were approached back in the early 90s by a ranger at the Bundalir Forest to uh, if we could make a chocolate bilby and after we found out what the bilby looked like we had a mould made and we started making chocolate bilbies in 1993 and they became so popular that we um, discontinued making chocolate rabbits a couple of years later and so we've been rabbit free for over 20 years. The rabbits really didn't belong in the uh, Australian landscape and so uh, uh, we decided to make a statement by actually not continuing with production of them. Do you like a bilby every once in a while, a chocolate bilby? You know, you're taking a little animal and commercialising something that has no meaning whatsoever to the message that it's supposed to portray. Does it Australianise and make more um, local the celebration of Easter? Though? It has no relationship to the story. That's the, that's the thing. It's, it's got no relationship to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. It's just a piece of chocolate. Do you think as a shopkeeper that we're getting good value for our money when we buy Easter eggs? Well, you wouldn't be getting value in chocolate, but you're getting value in presentation. What about this value in chocolate? Well, uh, there's actually, if you want value in chocolate, that's the way to buy it. Mm. But if you want presentation, a gift, something that's Easterly, you know, uh, this is the way to buy it. Uh, I think Australia is the highest consumer of Easter eggs per capita in the world. Everyone in the industry would love Easter to be a fixed date like Christmas, but as yet uh, that doesn't happen. Easter's described as a movable festival or a movable feast because it's not on a fixed date every year. This is because it falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And this means that it can move between around about the 21st of March to the 25th of April and is different every year. At Christchurch St Lawrence, they're preparing for tomorrow's Palm Sunday service and the start of Holy Week, the busiest and most solemn period of the Christian calendar. Holy Week, I guess, is, um, is sort of an emotional roller coaster. really. It has these high points, but then you go into the darkest places. Uh, but, but always this, this thread of, of God's love. You have Palm Sunday. This remembers the time where Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey with crowds of people welcoming him as a king. And so they're throwing palm branches in front of this donkey as he comes in. And this is quite a provocative act by Jesus coming down off the Mount of Olives and into Jerusalem because he's very deliberately enacting a prophecy from the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament that says, here comes your king riding on a donkey. And this is the sort of thing that could get you killed. If you think about the Gospels, not from a faith perspective, but from a kind of political perspective, an itinerant preacher who enters a major city and is acclaimed by a mob as the Messiah, which in Jewish theology had several possible meanings, but one of them was somebody who was going to become the temporal ruler of the world. You can imagine that this is very um, incendiary to the authorities and it marks him out for betrayal and ultimately execution, which happens on the Friday. On Palm Sunday is the, the week that Christ entered into uh, Jerusalem, initially hailed as a king, which is what we recount with the procession of, of palms. And I guess the thing for a church like this uh, is that, that we, we don't just kind of acknowledge uh, that the peaks and the troughs and the highs and the lows, we, we embrace them and we play them out uh, in, in, a, in a great sort of uh, liturgical, dramatic way. It's not 
about theatre, it's not about a concert, uh, it's about acknowledging that as human beings we have all of these emotions that we're, we're playing with and wrestling with all the time uh, and it's part of the human condition and it was for, for Christ so it should be for us too. Father Daniel symbolically requests entry into the church, the realm between heaven and humanity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, Easter, Easter is just mind blowing. For me, coming here at Easter, it's a pilgrimage and I've, I'm walking in the footsteps of the disciples and I really feel as though I'm there, I'm part of the fickle crowd on, on Palm Sunday, you know, jubilant and then betrayal. Red, uh, which we begin with on, on Palm Sunday, uh, is a colour of, of sacrifice. Uh, so the martyrs of the church are always remembered in, in red. Gold is, is, of course, about new life and resurrection. So the great festivals, Christmas and Easter, uh, become gold. So all of those things don't just happen for variety or, or because we want to keep things interesting. They all have a very definite uh, purpose and meaning. Easter is celebrated across the world varies enormously. So in some traditions, you have a lot of attention paid to uh, the church calendar, which is deliberately trying to sort of echo elements that are key to the story in a way that brings it alive for people in their own lives in a contemporary situation. There are some churches where they pay almost no attention to that. But the one thing that will bring all of them together, though, is the Easter weekend. For many families, the Easter hat parade is a sure sign that the Easter long weekend is just a short hop away. And does it lay eggs? Yes. Chocolate Easter eggs? Yes, like with bunnies. With bunnies, it lays bunnies as well. <laughs> Are you a bunny? It's the last day of the term and school holidays start tomorrow. And these kids are particularly excited because it's the day of the Easter hat parade and they're on their way to the local primary school to join in. The tradition of the Easter bonnet parade took off in New York in the 1870s. After church, people would strut the avenues in new clothes and fancy hats, reflecting the Easter theme of renewal. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with a lot of the secular expressions of Easter and Christmas and things like that because it's so much about joy and about families coming together and I guess that's what we are ab about here. So I think um, for us there, there's obviously another dimension to it. Does it make it more difficult to keep the religious message of Easter alive given all the commercial noise that surrounds this period? Oh, I, th I think for us, it's it's just always going to be there. So you know, and and we, um, I mean, I, I might sort of make jokes in 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 a sermon or something about hot cross buns being available on Boxing Day, uh, but really, you know, that's the way the world is. And I think um, I think we have to live in the world uh, and and see the good in it, uh, and um, and and still continue to to remain really committed to to our our traditions. The way that the Christian festival of Easter develops is kind of a combination of the Jewish elements in which the life of Jesus was actually lived and situated. If we think about the name for the festival of Easter, it's a word that derives from the Hebrew word Pesach, meaning Passover. So it's Pascha in Greek, Pasqua in Italian, and so on. In two Germanic languages, German and English, it's Easter or Ostara, Ostern, because 
those cultures had a goddess, a spring goddess called Yostra or Ostara, who brought back the warmth and the sun at the end of winter. So you can see that what's happening is that missionaries are moving into a community where people don't actually understand Judaism. And so they make bridges to other culturally important events and times so that people can understand the Christian festivals. Each year, hot cross buns make an early appearance. Another signpost that Easter is approaching. The soft, fluffy bun with raisins that we eat was again a 19th century kind of invention. There are lots of different arguments about where it came from and no one is in any kind of agreement. But we do know in the Middle Ages of oat cakes that had crosses stamped on them. And it seems very likely that it's simply bringing to mind of the crucifixion. While hot cross buns might be universally recognised as a symbol of Easter, my good friend Sandra has her own culinary tradition, Easter cupcakes. I mean, it's something that we do every year now. Mm. Um, I make them for home, I make them for friends. Do the kids love it? They do. They do. It's a family tradition. It's a family tradition. Is it a religious thing for you? No. For us, um, it's not about the religion, it's about the qualities of being good people. At my son's um, high school, the message there is welcome the stranger. It's Meaning what? Such a, it means don't judge people by the way they look or the way that they live. Anyone can make one bad decision in their lives and end up somewhere where they don't expect to be. It's about treating people respectfully and with kindness. For me, I think Easter is a really good time to reflect on that sort of thing. Your mum had her own Easter traditions when she was raising you. Very much. Mum's um, Serbian Orthodox. So for mum's tradition, it's the actual traditional painting of the eggs. These are Easter eggs that she painted. Aren't they divine? And then you keep these all year. So you, you don't give, the, give them away? You do. You, you do, give right. them away. And you give one per person. So if we went to visit my mum on Easter morning, that we get to pick, the, pick an egg each to have, and then you take it home and you keep it all year for good luck. Cheers, Cheers. gorgeous boy. Thank Happy you. Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> My own family also has a much-loved Easter ritual, shepherd's pie with a side of chilli sauce. Does it have religious significance? I mean, we... uh, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what we do. It's just that uh, when we thought it was shepherd's pie, you know, being going to a convent and in religious classes, mm. we always knew that um, Jesus was our shepherd. So we thought, oh, that's appropriate. Yeah. So that's when so we it started. Relevant. It was relevant then. Well, it made it relevant. <laughs> made yeah, the story made fit. it relevant, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's when it became like a tradition in our family, just our family. The week goes on, we get to the Thursday night, and this is where the drama of this story really starts to pick up. This is where Jesus celebrates what we now call the Last Supper. It's, it's really the Passover meal. This is a very important meal within Jewish history because it is recalling their uh, rescue out of slavery in Egypt. And Jesus has this meal with his disciples and he's saying to them, I'm heading towards my death here. They don't like to hear it and they kind of don't get it. But he said, this is where he says, you know, here's my body and he breaks the bread and here's my blood and he drinks the wine. And so from that point on, you have the betrayal where G Judas infamously uh, hands him over to the religious authorities. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is again a kind of very iconic moment, one that people down through the ages can really relate to because here is Jesus in his real humanity in an anguished state because he's he knows what's coming Echoing the events of the Last Supper, Father Daniel washes the feet of 12 people 
just as Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, to be an example of humility and love. On Maundy Thursday, we, we see with, with the washing of feet and Christ saying uh, to, to his disciples, whenever they do this, whenever they are servants to others, whenever they gather for the, the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper, you know, this God is there. This is my body given for you. Holy Communion is celebrated as it began at the Last Supper. Finally, in recognition of Christ's impending death, the church falls silent and into darkness. But that's not a universal interpretation of the Last Supper. Marrickville Road Anglican Church in Sydney's Inner West celebrates Easter very differently. Good job, mate. I know. That's a good job. Reverend Ross has invited me to his version of the Last Supper. Yeah. Every year we got this and four other legs of lamb in the, in the kitchen. What's the significance of the uh, Passover? Lamb Easter? Passover. Jesus would have had one of these, but not on the rotisserie. <laughs> but he definitely would have had nice lamb. And we are wanting to remember and celebrate um, that tradition of Jesus uh, the night before he was crucified. Do you find that people are curious about the way you practice Christianity here? And Absolutely. Well, the one thing they're curious is we're having meat <laughs> this weekend and, and we're having a barbecue tomorrow after Good Friday. And so that kind of people are spinning out going, but you're not meant to eat meat. And I and we you're breaking the rules, just breaking the rules. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not about the rules. It's about a vibrant relationship with God through Jesus. So that's one of the things. But the other thing is, um, it's just talking to people of all walks of life. And in our mill tonight, we'll probably have different social economic people represented tonight. And we're together around the table eating the same meal. Thursday afternoon is also when many Australians make the most of the four-day weekend and head out of town. The Sydney fish market's right in the middle of the Easter rush with retailers stocking their supplies for Good Friday. And supplies reaching the markets today have been heavy. 2,600 boxes of fish as against 1,500 for a normal day's trading. The eating of fish on Friday connects with the medieval Catholic idea that because Friday was the commemoration of Jesus' death, it ought to be a day of, if not fasting, at least restricting one's dietary pleasure. At this time, Jesus is handed over to the religious authorities, the Jewish authorities. Interestingly, all these male disciples sort of head for the hills and the women stay strong. It's an important part of the story, actually. He's then handed over to the Roman authorities. In this case, it's the governor, Pilate. And Jesus and Pilate have this very strange, intriguing interaction where Pilate gets very frustrated by Jesus' lack of willingness to even defend himself. But he's, he's left with this sort of nagging doubt because it's clear he's not comfortable handing over this man who he thinks is innocent to be crucified. However, he's swayed by the crowd. The crowd uh, call for Jesus to be crucified and eventually Pilate just sort of gives in to that. 
and hands him over, which of course involves him at one point having been uh, flogged and this awful crown of thorns put on him and this mocking him as a, as a supposed king. And then he's led away to be crucified and he carries his own cross. Uh, this is replicated in lots of places around the world with the stations of the cross that where people kind of uh, replay this, this moment in Christ's life as he goes towards his death. It's, it's unusual for an Anglican church to have Stations of the Cross, but it's something that's happened here uh, for, for several decades now. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Exhausted at the foot of Calvary, Jesus falls to the ground for a third time. We go around the church and there are the 14 Stations of the Cross, which I guess are the key points uh, from when Christ is condemned to die uh, to when he's laid in the tomb. So some more modern take on it would be that you have 15 stations, that you also have uh, the resurrection. Uh, but during Lent uh, on Friday evenings, we, we go around the church uh, for the Stations of the Cross. to go first. This is really a good step of faith, isn't it? It's, it's, uh... Marrickville Road Church breaks with religious tradition by baptising newcomers on Good Friday. Alice, as the church is your witness and the Lord is definitely your witness, mm. we baptise you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. You do baptisms on a Good Friday, why is that? Uh, the early church, uh, you know, just under 2,000 years ago, celebrated baptisms on that weekend, particularly on Good Friday. Uh, they want to celebrate the, the moment where uh, Jesus has crushed sin and, and has brought, brought us back to God through his death. And so baptism symbolises this dying to self and then rising to new life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah! It's uh, a lifetime experience, and I have been looking forward to it for a long time. So um, it's, it's really meaningful for us to be baptised here today. Why is it called Good Friday when it is such a solemn time of year? Yeah, I was confused growing up with that question myself. I think it's Good Friday because of what Jesus achieved for humanity. There's a lot of good that came as a result of him dying. He died for sins, he died in our place, and that's why it's good. We can have forgiveness with God, we can be right with God because of his sacrifice. Jesus goes to the cross in this ultimate act of sacrifice for not only people who love him, but people who are his enemies. And so he's saying to, the, to his disciples, if you wanna see true greatness, this is what it looks like. And it actually inverts our understanding of what true greatness is. Up until that point, this was a ludicrous idea, unthinkable in the Roman Empire, where you were supposed to seek and get honor for yourself. So on Good Friday, the church remembers this execution of the one who people thought was going to be this Messiah. And they're left with this very strange feeling of well, what happened to that? He's, he's now dead. It's a shocking event. They're not expecting this at all. But he ends up in the tomb. It's, it's over. And yet, as unexpected, even more unexpected, of course, is that on the Sunday morning, when people come to the tomb, they find it empty. It's a slow and sorrowful start to the Easter Vigil. In the darkness before midnight at Christ Church St. Lawrence, 
the faithful begin reflecting on Christ's crucifixion. We come into a dark church and, um, and the church has really been made barren on Good Friday. Uh, so it's, it's, it's absolute darkness and, and I guess despair in a way. And then suddenly there's this great sort of expression of hope as, as the fire is lit. What is the most important part of that ceremony, that liturgy for you? I guess it is the, it's the lighting of the, the candle. Uh, so the fire is lit, then the candle is lit. Uh, and that's our way of, of showing in the liturgy that, that there is you know, no place so dark that the light of Christ will, will not shine into it. May the light of Christ, rising in glory, dispel the darkness of our hearts and minds. It's at this moment when light fills the church again. The bells ring and solemnity gives way to the wonder that Christ is risen. Believers have come to understand that this is the thing that offers them the greatest hope in their lives. There is a hopefulness in the Easter story, a sort of a light in the darkness. That means the believer does not give way to despair. It's a defiant hopefulness. You feel as though you're part of the whole company of heaven praising the Lord. And we worship the Lord with all our senses in this parish. You know, it's um, just the most remarkable, moving experience. It's like a little seed that I clutch in the palm of my hand and at times of desolation, I just bring it out and I recall the smell of the incense and the beautiful music and the colour of the liturgy. And it anchors me, anchors me to my faith, to, to my Lord. who died for their testimony. He is risen from the dead. And friends, it is this resurrection that sets Jesus apart. As I said many times when I've been asked this question, what makes biblical Christianity different? It's the resurrection. Everyone's born, everyone dies, but only one person's come back. Here in the church garden, spirituality meets earthly delights. The Easter egg hunt is in full swing. I, I love buying Easter eggs on Easter Monday because they're half price. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and I love those experiences with my kids. Um, I love the fact that Easter eggs keeps Easter on the agenda. So why not let's keep Easter on the agenda with Easter eggs. The thing about the life of Jesus and the Easter story that I like to tell people, irrespective of their belief, is that it's worth spending some time just looking at this story because it's just a cracking story. It has been, of course, the inspiration for so much of our art, our literature, our music, film, across you know, the, the decades and the centuries. What is Easter? Time for eggs. Time for eggs. What's Easter to you? When, when God got alive again. What's Easter to you? 
It's a new life. A new life. Is that why you're wearing a new hat? Yeah. Why do you have Easter eggs? New eggs. New things. New things. Hatch out of eggs. For fun. Most Christians would say that Easter is actually much more important uh, than Christmas uh, because the whole Christian message uh, is, is about resurrection and new life. We love Christmas, but, but everything is really moving towards uh, Easter, that it is certainly the more important celebration. There's no doubt Easter offers something to everyone. It is the cornerstone of Christianity. Without it, there wouldn't be the holidays, the chocolate, the family gatherings that we associate with Easter today. Yeah. Customs that symbolize the central message of Easter, belief in new life after death. Easter will surely continue to bring us together both inside and outside the church. There was one inside your Lord Thomas. I took it out. I found some in the shoe.